TV this weekend on C-SPAN 2. Next on Lectures in History, George Washington University professor Chris Tuda teaches a class about foreign relations between the United States and the Soviet Union during President Reagan's administration. He begins with the Iran-Contra affair, then examines how changes in Soviet leadership during the 1980s impacted Cold War policies in both countries. His class is about 75 minutes. All right, this morning we're going to finish up our discussion of Iran-Contra, which, as we discussed on Monday, is the, for lack of a better word, disaster that occurred from the whole Lebanese intervention. Keep in mind, in the early 80s, 82, 83, when Reagan decides because of all the problems that are occurring in Lebanon. As a reminder, why do we intervene? Why did the United States join the French and the Italians in sending peacekeepers, Marines, to Lebanon? What's happening in that country in the early 80s? Vikram. American hostages have been taken. In other words, remember, these are civilians for the most part. Until 1984, when the chief of the CIA station, William Buckley, the other Buckley, is kidnapped. But literally, these men are taken off the streets. Basically, there are, you know, what we now know are Hezbollah or other um, militants terrorists, whatever word you want to use, in Lebanon, who are basically kidnapping guys off the streets. And most of these guys are employees of either the university, American University in Beirut. One guy is a priest. But there are also attempted assassinations. And so there is a hostage issue. And seven hostages are taken and held by these groups. By the way, I forgot to mention that there were also French and German hostages who were also taken by the same groups. So this is a problem for the U.S. What else is happening that leads us to send in the peacekeepers? We really didn't do it as a response to the hostages, but the hostages are being taken. What else is going on? I mean, it's a, it's a crisis. Matthew. The PLO is waiting The PLO was kicked out, had been kicked out of Jordan. They are now in Lebanon. The PLO has been using Lebanon, in particular southern Lebanon, to launch terrorist attacks into northern Israel, which led to what? What else happened in 1982? Israel invades Lebanon. And this time they stay. They had invaded very briefly in 1978, but had pulled out, I'm not sure exactly how long they were there, a couple weeks, maybe a month. This time they're there. Okay. Who else is in Lebanon? Syria. Syria, which had intervened and sent in troops in 1975 or 76. They've been around They have basically been occupying Lebanon. What is the other dynamic that is fueling these interventions? There's another thing to complicate things. Cole. Iran is supporting Hezbollah. Iran is supporting Hezbollah. Okay, in whatever forms, whether first it's money, then it's uh, sending in uh, Iranian... Revolutionary Guards, they're in the Baqa Valley and in other places, and doing some kind of coordination with Hezbollah and the Syrians. There's another complication. I mean, Lebanon is a really difficult place. What else is happening? Just to add another dimension of difficulty. The Civil War. The tenuous um, balance between Christian Lebanese 
and Muslim Lebanese has been altered by all of these different dynamics. So they're in a civil war, and they've been in a civil war since 75, 76. Okay? So the U.S. sends peacekeepers. 1983, two different attacks on the U.S. The embassy bombing, which also decimates the CIA guys. That's in the recommended book that I put on the list, um, The Good Spy. That guy, Robert Ames, was one of the guys killed in that devastating attack, which also killed about 30 French uh, diplomats. And then the one in October of 83, which killed the Marine Barracks attack, which forces Reagan to confront whether or not we should stay there. And in that big argument between Schultz and Weinberger, Weinberger wins. Influenced, as we talked about, by Colin Powell. The Weinberger doctrine is really the Powell doctrine. The idea, if you're not going to be in this place to win, or you don't have an exit strategy, Quagmire could come. So he says, we can't do this, Mr. President. Reagan sides with Weinberger. But the hostages remain, even though our troops pull out. So what is cooked up in 84, late 84, but really 85 and 86, is what becomes known as Iran-Contra, which is selling weapons, in this particular case, the tow anti-tank missiles, to Iran, which they will use how? Why are they... Why do they want these sophisticated weapons? James. They're in their middle of what becomes an eight, is in, eventually is an eight year war with Iraq. Iraq is being funded or supplied by the Soviets. The U.S., McFarlane, Poindexter, ultimately Oliver North, the staff member, we believe that if we cultivate what we think are the moderates within Iran, they will get the hostages back for us. And it's okay if we sell weapons to them because, well, we can make sure that there is no clear winner in the Iran-Iraq war, whatever. Meanwhile, we know that we also have some kind of relationship with the Iraqis for the reasons we discussed on Monday balance of power, revenge for the hostage, whatever it may be. But then, this is the contrapart. This is bad enough. What does this violate? The top part. Yuki. That Congress passed how we weren't supposed to do anything. That's the second part. Let's hold off on that for just a second. Cole. The arms embargo? The arms embargo? And you also yeah. negotiate with terrorists. The United States doesn't negotiate with terrorists. So we are violating one Iran thing, which is the embargo that we've, in, we've been placed on them, that Carter had placed on them, that Reagan continues during the hostage crisis. But the key thing here is that our policy is to not negotiate with terrorists, and certainly, <laughs> or terrorist supporters. And we certainly aren't going to be supposed to be selling weapons to them. So that's controversial to say the least. Now the second part is where we get into Yuki and her comment, which is about constitu- the Constitution. Because we are going to divert the profits from these weapons sales to these guys. Who are these guys again? Dion. Those are the ones fighting the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Right. They are the anti-Marxist uh, rebels, to say the least. Not exactly democratic with a small d, right? Many, McKinley, you're smiling, kind of. What? Who are they, some of them? Some of them are uh, kind of a random mix of people. They're not necessarily a coordinated group. Right. Um, they just all have... I know some value in them. They didn't like the sentence. It's a lot of right. ex businessmen who didn't. Yeah, you've got capitalists funding them. You've got former Somoza 
National Guardsmen, not exactly Democratic, right, with a small d. So they're not, they're not, I mean, Reagan considers them freedom fighters because they are anti-Marxist. But they're not exactly, you know, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. The problem with this is that the House had passed an amendment in 1982, the Boland Amendment, which Reagan had signed, which said, which prevented the United States government, the executive branch, whatever word you want to use, from overthrowing the Sandinista government. Okay? So, this news breaks... Did anyone catch how it broke, how it came out? Cole. Uh, Magazine in Lebanon? Yeah, Uh, of all places, a random act of journalism in Lebanon. And then it comes into the U.S. papers in November of 86, right around the time of the midterm elections, which Reagan, you know, sixth year of his term, the odds are the Democrats are going to take over. They do. This explodes onto the to the national scene because if the House passes something, you're not supposed to go around it, right? Well, right? So you have two controversial parts, dealing with terrorists and then diverting the money for something we're not really supposed to be doing. Now, what's the loophole that really, in, in reality, prevents any serious, serious real talk or move for impeachment. Nice. Um, isn't it like the amendment says you're not supposed to overthrow the government, but they can argue that they're not technically trying to overthrow them? Yeah, pretty much. And so pretty much the conservative response, the Reagan defender's response, by the way, Reagan comes out and does take responsibility for it, but kind of claims he didn't really know what was happening, that, which, I don't know, I mean, the jury is out on that. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that, that that's really plausible, but who knows? We'll see when the documents come out. But what we do know is that Reagan was personally affected by the, the hostages and wanted to do anything he could to get them out. And from the Christ reading, he argues that there were elements the National Security Council, the State Department, in the government, who wanted to pursue some kind of, whatever you want, word you want to use, rapprochement with Iran, or some, open up some kind of channels with Iran, for whatever reason there might be. That's the most generous defense you could make. But what really is happening is that they're not thinking about, I would argue, they're not really thinking through this whole issue. Do we get the hostages back? No. So after all of this, we talked about this on Monday, the attempt to find moderates within Iran, they are relative moderates. They are not interested in being friends with the U.S. They are not interested in westernizing. They are not interested in a real rapprochement. Somehow, educated guys, I mean, McFarlane was no dummy. Poindexter had a PhD. You know, these aren't theoretically dumb people. And yet they... For whatever reason, Machiavellian maybe it was, maybe it was, hey, we can get the president, we can get those hostages back, the American people won't care how we did it. For whatever reason, this doesn't work at all. In fact, the hostages don't end up getting returned until Bush is president. And then this is where you have this fight between the executive and legislative branches. The pro-Reaganites, the defenders of Reagan, basically, I've re- to this day, it's now been 32 years, many of them still explain it away 
as a political disagreement. As a di- the goal is to defeat the Sandinistas. That's a worthy goal. This was a dumb amendment by a bunch of political liberals who didn't know what they were doing. That's what they say to this day, some of them. What is their response? Why did their, why did they, the Congress, Senate, have hearings? Right after I graduated from college in May, June, 1987. And that's when we, we learned who Oliver North was. Why did they have hearings? What's at stake here? Matthew? It doesn't really matter like, what your view of, is the, of the policy. Like, you know, it's, you, it's either legal or illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Vikram, is that what you're going to say? Or? Yeah, I was going to say basically the same thing. Yeah, I mean, there are constitutional issues involved here. Leaving aside whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing to support the Contras, the House of Representatives voted on it and overwhelmingly voted on it. So what they were doing was defying the House. And remember, the House owns or controls the purse strings. They're the ones who set the budgets. Okay? Yeah, Deanna. Didn't the amendment pass like 400-something yeah, to zero? It was overwhelming. So, was there any significant pushback from the Republicans, or were they kind of just going along? As far as I know, they were either going, they either agreed with it or just went along. But you're right. It was like 411. I'm glad I forgot the number. I didn't want to throw out a number. That's overwhelming. Okay? So this was the House of Representatives sentiment codified in an amendment to a, what, it was a defense bill or something like that, appropriate, whatever it was. The point is that the executive is not supposed to do that. Okay? At this point, this is where you begin to see retrospectively or retroactively, whatever word is correct, some critics of Reagan saying, oh, this is where he may have been uh, getting Alzheimer's or feeling the effects of Alzheimer's disease, which he eventually got in the early to mid-90s. I don't see any evidence of that at all. I think they just were deluded into thinking they could achieve their goals. And the problem is, this is where you have the argument between rogue elements within the government. This was debated. You know? Schultz said it was a crazy idea. Weinberger said it was a crazy idea. So it's not like it came out of left field and no one thought about it and then Oliver North just went out on his own. You know, and McFarlane goes over the famous story where they bring a cake as a present to Iran. This was in the, you know, this was in the White House. So what it shows is it's, it's the lowest moment for the Reagan administration by any stretch. Because remember, the hostages don't get returned. So after all of this, PR disaster, foreign policy disaster, those seven guys are still there. Vikram. So why would the uh, Reagan administration go through with selling the arms if they hadn't already received some of the hostages? Like, why would they leave with that? I have no idea. That's one of the unanswerable. I would have, if I had been doing this, I would have said, before I give you a single missile, I want two or three of them. As a, sh- as a show of good faith. You know, we ever, you watch these cop shows where they have hostages being taken. Send out the women and children or send out the, the guy who you shot in the, in the robbery attempt. McKinley. Is there any argument that Iran didn't actually have as much control over Hezbollah as they thought? Yep, probably. And the pushback from that is to say... Well, we know you're coordinating something. Remember, though, that in Christ's book, he talks about how they can't prove conclusively that the Iranians were behind the attack on the barracks. Everyone believes and knows in their hearts. 
But if they're going to go and attack either the Bekaa Valley, Iranian installations in the Bekaa Valley, or Hezbollah, or Iran proper, they're going to need proof. And they can't find it. So remember, after that 1983 barracks attack, the French are angry. They respond, but we don't attack with them. And Christ argues is that the French were so angry and upset about that that three years later in 1986, when we bombed Libya for supporting terrorism, the French wouldn't let us fly over their country. Um, the, the planes left from bases in England, so we had to go around. We'll see if that's true or not. I don't know if the documents are going to show that. Yeah. The funds getting diverted to just the Contras fighting Sandinistas seems very specific. Did the funds go anywhere else? Or that I know of. Nope. Not that I know of. So earlier you said that while giving them the weapons, they made sure that nobody won the war? The, the argument from some of the people who said we should give Iran weapons... We don't want Iraq to win the war or Iran to win the war. We want a balance because we don't want one country to control the Persian Gulf. How does that happen? How does that happen? This is where you're getting into this whole rationality, mutually assured destruction, balance of power stuff. How does it happen? Or are they reading textbooks and it sounds good in a theory? Giving intelligence to Iraq on We what? are giving intelligence to Iraq. The balance because Iraq is um, supported by the Soviet Union. Yeah, so we have to make sure that the Iraqis don't win because then that will help the Soviet. I mean, it's like I said, it's like you're putting pieces on a chessboard and trying to figure out which move, which move, which counter move, etc. Balances the two countries. What we don't want. And we're going to see this next week when we talk about the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. We don't want one country to control the Gulf because the Saudis don't have a big enough army to really defend themselves. And we are not at this time willing to send American troops to defend Saudi Arabia. So when Iran falls apart, that twin pillars strategy goes right down the toilet. And now the real fear is that Iraq will dominate the region. Does that make sense? It's confusing because, again, it's, it's like you're trying to figure out who wins or who doesn't win. And it's a delicate balance. That's why, jumping ahead 15 years, when we decide in 2003 to overthrow Saddam Hussein, it's such a big deal. Because we had not gone that far or been willing to go that far to break that balance or that balance that we perceive should exist. Any questions? There's a lot more, obviously, we can do on this. But keep this in mind. It's not only a foreign policy disaster. It's a domestic crisis, constitutional crisis. It's a disaster because it puts Reagan in this unfamiliar spot as a guy who seems willing to give in to the bad guys. Whereas what he'd been doing for six years, five, six years, and even his previous career, he was the tough guy against the Soviet Union, against whomever. And now it looks like we're kissing up to these guys who only six, seven years before had had 52 of our hostages. So like I said, this is a low point of his administration. And it looks as if, if you combine that, with what we discussed on t- Monday with Reykjavik, when, Re- when Reagan and Gorbachev walk out of Reykjavik, and it looks like a disaster, it looks as if there's nothing much to salvage from this administration. He's a lame duck. He's got two years left, and there's nothing much that's going to really happen. Okay? What ends up happening is the subject of much of today. Because within three years, 
the Berlin Wall is going to fall. Within five years, the Soviet Union is going to dissolve. Nobody except Reagan and the guys in the White House, who Schultz in the State Department, expected this. They didn't expect it to happen right away. But remember, what made Reagan's policy different from both Carter and Nixon and Ford, the Republicans and the Democrats? Alex. Uh, he thought we could win. Right. He thought we could defeat the Soviet Union. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. Without resulting in a nuclear war. In other words, the U.S. could defeat the Soviet Union because of a combination, and again, this is where we get into those theories we talked about, a combination of our strengths, the United States', Washington's, American spirit of capitalism, free trade, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The stuff that, Pia, that you asked me about in your email, the Reagan program, which was different from his fellow Republicans and Carter, is to not accept detente. At least that's what he said. But there's also a combination of American strengths and Soviet weakness. And that's where Gorbachev comes in. Now remember one Monday, and it's in the reading as well, we talked about the landscape that Reagan walks into when it comes to the Soviet Union. The phrase he said, uh, allegedly or anecdotally, they keep dying on me. Three Soviet premiers in his first term. The key to them, though, is not the fact, not just the fact that they're all very old and very sick, but that they are dyed in the wool, not just you know, neo-Stalinists, not just hardcore communists, but they are also tied or dedicated to mutually assured destruction. None of them are really willing, other than, the, I mean, we are talking, the start talks have begun, but there is no real push from the top to sign a treaty. Okay? Gorbachev, however, is different. What ways is in what ways is he different? James. To start off, he's substantially younger than okay, the rest of the policy. So he's about twenty five or thirty years younger than the other guys in the Politburo and his predecessors. Why is that significant? If you think about, if you guys know anything about Soviet history, 20th century. Sean. I would argue he probably didn't live through the world, uh, World War II the same way. That he was a child during World War II, as opposed to who? <clears throat> as opposed to Brezhnev, who? He was an officer. Yeah, he was in the army. He was a soldier. Brezhnev and that, his cohort, these guys who were in the 80s, lived through World War II as adults. Okay, Gorbachev was younger. He was born, I think, 1932 or 3. So he's like 53 or 52 when he takes over. In late 84, early 85. First thing is his youth. What else distinguishes him? He like wants to reform. Yeah. So if you put these two together, who inspired him as a leader in Soviet history? If you want to reform the Soviet Union, who would you like as a leader? This is kind of a wild guess, but Catherine the Great, maybe? No, no. He's too, I'm sorry, she said Soviets. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, if you looked at Russian history in general, yeah, Catherine the Great. What about the 20th century? Which guy? Lenin, maybe? No. 
which generation, under which guy does he come, becomes an adult? Stalin, right? No. Right after. Prussia. No. Khrushchev. Khrushchev. Why is that so important? He's a Khrushchevite. You guys came close. It's good you know some of the names. That's okay. Why is that important? What is Khrushchev known for? Sean. Khrushchev was very much not the type of despot that Stalin was. Yeah. He was a a reformer. Now, this doesn't mean that he was a Democrat. This is very important to remember. Democrat with a small d again. Khrushchev was a bad guy. They all lived, they, he, to survive Stalin, you had to have known what was happening. You had to have been either lucky enough not to be executed or sent to the gulags or connected, whatever it may be. But he had denounced Stalin. We talked about this last semester in 1956. Has anyone ever heard of the de-Stalinization speech besides Tom's? Have you heard of it? Or you look like you're... Yeah. What is it? Do you remember? Um, yeah, the secret speech. Uh, it was basically um, after things had settled in the, the sort of post-death, um, you know, power struggle and everything. Of Stalin. Yeah, of, yeah. of Stalin. Um, Khrushchev gave a speech to the Politburo that mm-hmm. lasted at least a couple of hours where he basically denounced nearly every single thing that Stalin did. Yeah. Um, it, it was to, actually it wasn't even the Politburo, it was an even bigger group of people. <clears throat> a couple hundred people, but yeah, one of these long-winded... The communists would talk for hours and hours and hours. Castro was famous for four-hour speeches. <clears throat> I mean, you know, nobody in this country, did, even Obama didn't, or Clinton didn't speak that long. These guys... Khrushchev and the guys who came after Stalin, it's almost like they're like, oh, we survived. We don't want to go back to what he did. What had Stalin done that appalled true reformer communist type guys like Khrushchev and then subsequently Gorbachev? This won't be on the final, but it's important as context. What had he been doing? The famines that he had caused in the 1930s that killed millions of people. What else? Like the purges. Then they got the purges of the late 30s where he basically... Remember we talked about the Cultural Revolution in China? This is a different type of power struggle where Stalin is trying to get rid of his enemies. This is where you see for the first time, 1937, 38, what they called show trials where guys would be literally brought up where they would have to confess their sins, that they had somehow deviated from, you know, true Marxism, Leninism, as espoused by either Lenin or Stalin. And then they'd take them out and either shoot them or send them to the gulags, where a lot of them died. So the numbers of the great, what became known, if you combine the two, as the Great Terror Stalin was probably around 20 million people before World War II. Interestingly enough, a lot of the guys that he either killed or sent to the gulag were generals, the most skilled members of the military, the most guys he thought could possibly overthrow him, who were in the gulags when the Nazis invaded in 1941. And suddenly he's like, "Uh uh-oh. Most historians believe that he had a mental breakdown or some kind of panic attack and then said, "Uh uh-oh, I need to get these guys back. Let's hope most of them are still alive. Okay? Khrushchev comes in in 56 and says, this is horrible. We can't do this again. There's another component of what he said that also resonates with Gorbachev that he criticized Stalin for. Anyone know? It often gets lost in the, in the very real condemnation of the terror. He also criticized what he called Stalin's cult of personality. You've heard this, Diana? You look like you're nodding. What does that mean? I saw um, you nodding. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, just that a lot of his kind of power was consolidated in the persona rather than the idea of communism and Marxism. Think of other dictators who build 
massive monuments to themselves and basically say that, and you know, this is throughout history. Um, Saddam Hussein, uh, various North Korean leaders, where you have statues everywhere, photos everywhere, Mao's photo, massive banners all around cities. Haig talked about that when he went to, uh, Kissinger talked about it too, wrote about it in documents and his memoirs, but when they went, first went to Beijing, they'd see all these massive posters with slogans from Mao. The same was true of Stalin. And Khrushchev said communism is bigger than that. It's bigger than one guy who has strayed from the path. Okay? So Khrushchev temporarily um, institutes like a thaw in things. He lets go Solzhenitsyn. Remember we talked about him in, in, uh, before the midterm? We read about how that trip to the White House that was canceled. Solzhenitsyn was released under Khrushchev's amnesty. And remember, he had been thrown in the gulags. What had he done? What was his crime? He was a POW. He was a POW. That's all he had done. He had been captured by the Germans. He had not tried to overthrow Stalin. He had not tried to burn a collective farm. That was his only crime. This is where you hear this story, by the way, that come out of the Soviet Union and other places like this, Nazi Germany, thought crimes. The stuff that... George, how many of you guys have read 1984? That, I just watched the movie. I hadn't seen it in decades. It's on Amazon Prime, if you ever see it. It's really, a really good adaptation from the book. The whole idea of thought crimes and a police state. Remember, the KGB... And its predecessors are the ones who enforce Soviet totalitarianism. You can't do it with a Nazi Germany. You had the Gestapo and the SS, right? So Khrushchev wants to change that. Temporarily it works. He also allows the other members of the Warsaw Pact to liberalize a little, which kind of backfires on him, on him when the Hungarians revolt. And then he turns around and crushes it. Gorbachev was a Khrushchevite and was just so disappointed about the Hungarian intervention. And then, if you read more about Gorbachev, you find that the uh, 1968, I always point to you because you brought it up, Alex, but the Prague intervention really dispirited Gorbachev. And, the, and the, everything that we know, as far as I can tell, is that Gorbachev and his fellow reformers kind of went underground, kept quiet and moved up in the bureaucracy. So by the time 1984 happens, in the end of 84, what does he do before he is named general secretary? He does something that jumps out at us. Cole. Um, I forget who, but one of the premiers died, and he sort of led um, the Politburo or the discussions. The As Chernenko is, we now know, dying, he is taking more of a de facto role. That's the first thing. And Kremlinologists, the Soviet experts who are watching, are like, we think this is going to be the new guy. That's the first thing. What's the second thing that's more public? James. He's with Thatcher. Right. Makes a famous trip to London. In 1984, <clears throat> excuse me, it's December, it's right before Christmas. And this is where one of her very famous phrases, I think we can do business with this guy. What does Gorbachev tell her? Now, she's no naive, you know, McFarlane, Poindexter guy. She's the type of person who sees, she's very much a hard, tough person who isn't, snowed by the idea of moderation or whatever. What would lead this person, who is just as anti-communist as Reagan, to not only say that, but then to get on a plane, go to, go to Washington, and tell Reagan, take this guy seriously? What is he saying? He, Gorbachev wants to reduce military spending to let the Soviet economy thrive. That's the first thing. 
He see. Remember, we talked a little about. I mentioned this on Monday, and I think I mentioned it last week too. When <clears throat> Gorbachev starts to realize that all these massive military sales the Soviet Union has been making for about 20 years, no one has paid the bills, or very few have paid the bills, especially these rich, oil-rich countries like Libya and Iran. I mean Iraq, with all their oil money, and they're not even paying their bills. There's a me- you talk about we talk about deficits in this country. We talk about recessions, whatever. The Soviet economy is in horrible shape. Everything that we went, the United States went through, that the English went through in the 70s, is nothing compared to what's going on in the Soviet Union. And we've already talked about what's the reality of Soviet life in the 60s, 70s, and now in the 80s when he takes over. Matt. Like massive food shortages and people can't even meet their basic needs. Food shortages. Someone asked me, I can't remember which one of you guys asked me, about the grain sales last week or the week before. Reagan, in 1981 and 82, one of the re- things that Carter did was embargo grain sales to punish them for their invasion of Afghanistan. Reagan decides ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, to lift that embargo. Okay? They can't feed themselves. Stalin, when he, when he instituted, when those famines were created, they were basically <clears throat> political attacks in Ukraine. That's why the Ukrainians can't stand the Russians. One reason, many reasons. But one of them is that the Ukrainians, for the most part, were the biggest victims of the famines. Because that's their breadbasket. That's like their Kansas, Nebraska, you know, our country where we produce all the grains and everything. They can't feed themselves, so they have to go, <clears throat> excuse me, buy the stuff from the U.S., Canada, Argentina, other countries, <clears throat> and have large farming um, uh, economic sectors. <clears throat> so Gorbachev's like, wait a minute, we've got to figure out a way to feed our people. What else is the reality of the workers' paradise? James? Rampant alcoholism. Alcohol. I know it sounds funny. But one of the big things that he believes is that we, in order to reform and fix communism, we, the Soviet Union, have to deal with our massive alcoholism problem. Has anyone ever heard stories about the average citizen or the average worker in the, by the time of the 70s and 80s and booze? Ever read anything about it? It's in like every... Thomas? I, I heard in some factories they had to like... On Monday and on certain days of the week, they had to start later because everyone had to work off their hangover. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are they, they were anecdotal at first, but then they became the reality that there was it was that there were some numbers. I think thirty five percent of the population was alcoholic. Something outrageous like that. It was a lot of people. And Gorbachev's like, wait a minute, we've got you know we've got societal problems. You got too much defense spending, alcoholism, food shortages, which creates what? What's the ancillary blowback or the ancillary effect of food shortages? Who feeds the people? A black market. And who is, who's running the black market, interestingly enough, or benefits from it as well? Anyone know? Yeah. The Nicole? Elites. The elites, Chechen organized crime and other organized crime uh, gangs who are the ones who f- they're figuring out a way to get around all the regulations. All, remember those quotas we talked about? The quotas of nobody's rewarded if you produce more food. So the black marketeers are the guys who figure out a way to bring oranges from Sochi or the, um, uh, the Baltics, that air in the Baltics, drawing a blank on the name of the sea, down, pardon me? Thank you, the Black Sea, up to Moscow and to Leningrad and other places. And so you have a dysfunctional economy. Okay? Reagan believes that this is a dysfunctional economy. Reagan believes 
that this whole, one of the reasons he's so critical of detente is he believes that the Soviet Union is vastly overhyped in its power. That doesn't mean that he doesn't recognize or believe that they still are spending too much money on weapons. But he be- this is where you get into that theory that some have argued that Reagan deliberately wants to outspend the Soviets into bankruptcy. We know that he wants to, I think the, some of the phrases are advocate and um, exacerbate stresses and strains within the Soviet economy, within the Eastern European economy, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure the exact words, but it's in a number of the documents. So Gorbachev, once he takes power in March of 85, what does Reagan do? He sends Bush and Schultz to Chernyenko's funeral to meet with Gorbachev, the vice president and the secretary of state. And they have very productive meetings after the funeral's over. But Bush warns him. It's a great quote. It's in my book. He says, this Gucci comrade, don't get snowed by his appearance. What do I mean by that? Why else did he make a sensation in, in London? You're laughing. Do you remember why he said that or what Gorbachev had done? No. It's okay. Cool. He's young, he has charisma, his wife is stylish. Yeah, he wears three-piece suits that are tailored in London. I mean, you know. In other words... Think of, has, does anyone, I should have put up photos, but has anyone seen a photo of Brezhnev or his prede, any of the predecessors? Anyone ever seen what these guys look like? What do they look, Deanna, you've seen them. Not great. Not that great. Even when they were young, the Brezhnevs, the eyebrows, the crazy eyebrows. But the way these guys dressed, the way they acted, Khrushchev was, I mean, he was nuts in a lot of ways. Flamboyant, to say the least. But Gorbachev looks and acts like a Westerner. And Bush says, yeah, he's interested in talking to us. When Thatcher had, by the way, let me step back a second. When Thatcher had gone to Washington right before Christmas, after the the visit, she had said to him, hey, you know, he's interested in opening up markets. He's interested in reforming communism. But let's not forget, he's trying to fix it and strengthen it. And Bush reminds Reagan don't be snowed by this Gucci comrade. He may look stylish and Western, but he's a communist. Okay? And because the temptation, as we've seen before with other countries, is to assume that a new guy wants to democratize with a small d. And that's not what he wants to do. He might want to liberalize a little. And we'll see that when we get to Glasnost, which is later. But right now, what is this word, perestroika? Does anyone know what it means in translation? Doesn't it mean like restructuring? It does. What does that mean? Like, so, James? Yeah. Yeah. To increase the efficiency of already established Soviet like economic systems. Okay, good. What else? He wants to promote kind of entrepreneurship and innovation within the industry as well. Yeah, so in other words, adopt some capitalistic forms. Vikram mentioned earlier, is this Lenin? And I said, no, it's Khrushchev. But there is a way, does anyone know how you can ideologically justify perestroika? Little trivia from the 1920s. Before Lenin died, does anyone know what he did after the Civil War ended? Thomas. The NEP. NEP. Again, this won't be on the final, but the NEP. What does it stand for? You know? You're right. I know what it is, but I don't know. Okay. It's called the New Economic Policy. What does it mean? Um, It's uh, basically the whole theory was for Lenin that... We can't go straight to communism yet. Um, Russia is still like a, you know, it's agrarian based, so we need to build industry, and the way to do that is through markets. 
Yeah, so you temporarily adopt capitalism in order to create, ultimately, socialism slash communism. James. The ideological structure that the yeah. Chinese Communist Party is based on at the moment. Absolutely. When we get to Clinton, we're going to talk a little about that, about how we think that what they're doing is democratizing, but what they're really doing is what Lenin argued for. So ideologically, Gorbachev can say, yeah, let's innovate, let's allow, for example, small farmers to not have to join a commune and pool all their resources. So if you're, it's, it's October now, so if you're the guy who makes all, uh, makes, grows all the pumpkins, in order to encourage you to grow more pumpkins, because, you know, we have to have pumpkin spice vodka. I'm just making this up. Because you know how it is around here now. You know, everything is pumpkin spice. It's disgusting. But um, let's just, for argument's sake, say, hey, there's a market for pumpkin spice vodka. Let's encourage this guy on his farm to do that. Because if he can sell these bottles of vodka to, I don't know, West Germany, Finland, wherever... What can he make? Well, he can grow the Soviet economy. Yes. And what, what's in it for him? Profit. Profits. <gasps> Capitalism. Ultimately, though, this pro- these profits can then strengthen the Soviet communist state. And, he, and so you, he has opposition to this. And he can say, Lenin did it. And Lenin, it's always Marxism-Leninism in the Soviet Union. By the way, it's the same in China. Because these are the two guys who basically set up the ideology. Hey, I'm not doing anything radical. I'm doing just what Lenin would have done. And... Guess what else I'm going to do? I'm going to cut defense spending. Now, that's where the danger is. Because what's going to happen is that he is going to have the same type of opposition that Khrushchev had. That eventually, in 1964, Brezhnev overthrew. They removed him, Khrushchev. Gorbachev knows that this is not going to be easy. He knows it's going to be controversial. Now we, the United States, what does Reagan want to do? Reduce nukes and ultimately eliminate them. So there's a meeting of the minds, at least on the surface, where Gorbachev needs Reagan and Reagan needs Gorbachev. Because remember, the three guys who Reagan theoretically could have met with, had they all been healthy did not believe in reducing nuclear weapons. They accepted SALT, the parity of equality. Thousands of nukes on one side, thousands of nukes on the other. That keeps the peace. Reagan said no. Remember, Reagan doesn't believe in MAD. That makes him different from... I mean, Carter had talked a little about it, but because the the Soviets were so opposed, he just abandoned it. Reagan believes in arms reductions. Okay? We talked on on Monday about the whole issue of SDI and Reykjavik and how that initially makes Reykjavik a disaster. But what happens, remember this is 86, Reykjavik, about a year later, because Gorbachev gave up his demands that the U.S. abandon SDI. And now, of course, it's just a reminder, we don't know exactly why. Was he convinced that the U.S. was going to outspend him? And that he said, I'm going to just give up? Or did it fit in already with his ideas of perestroika? And there's an argument to be made for both of them. We'll see, again, whether or not the Reagan documents show a conscious strategy for this. It's one thing to say we want to defeat the Soviet Union. It's another to say we're going to do this by outspending them into bankruptcy. 
that could have been just another thing that we thought of, or Reagan thought of, and his advisors thought of, as a means to defeat them. Okay? The Reaganites definitely believe that this is all a big strategy. Most of them do. Okay? Whether it is or not, we'll see. So, this is the first breakthrough. So keep in mind that Reykjavik occurs right around the time of Iran-Contra. Within a year, this is signed. And it's a huge, huge deal. To your second question. So Reagan's economic policies, Reagan's ideas of freedom definitely resonated. We're going to talk a little more about that when we talk about Moscow. But one of your other questions, Peter, was did anyone oppose Reagan? And the answer is yes. The Democrats couldn't stand Reagan. But when it came to this kind of stuff, they didn't have much of an argument because they had wanted, the liberals especially, to reduce WEP nukes. Remember, the liberals had to be convinced by Vance that SALT II was enough because they criticized SALT II for not going far enough. Who opposed arms reductions, nuclear arms reductions? Cole. Opposed, but wasn't Bush really wary about Bush it? Bush was very wary. His vice president, but he keeps his criticism quiet. Nobody knows that this will come out afterwards. Who are publicly opposed? You're kind of on the right track. If we say Bush is wary of it, who, which other decision makers who we've discussed this semester would have been opposed? Nope, not Weinberger, actually. Well, eventually he goes on with it, but he's wary at first. The Nixon, Kissinger types? Is that what you're going to say? Nixon, Kissinger, and... Scope. Yeah. Never mind. You sure? What about Powell? Powell, at this point, is still just, still just. He's moving up. By 87, he is closer to be... By 88, he's going to be a national security advisor. Um, I don't know what his position was. It, I actually found an extra copy of his memoirs. It might be in there. Rumsfeld was with him, as far as I can tell. It was Bush, who was wary, we find out later. Nixon, Kissinger, and Scowcroft. The Nixonites, the detente guys. Nixon and, and, and Kissinger co-write an op-ed condemning Start and the INF. Why? So these are his fellow Republicans. They believe in that. Yeah. They think that uh, nuclear arms reductions is inherently destabilizing. Okay? Whereas Reagan thought... That MAD was destabilizing. And this has been an argument. By the way, this, this goes back to the 50s, the idea of what is rational. Is it rational to be able to blow each other up so much that neither side will start a nuclear war? Or is it irrational that you're building up so many weapons, spending so much money... With the, with the idea that the whole world can be blown up, is that irrational? So here we are now, 30 years or so after these debates really began under Ike, where you have the Republicans arguing publicly that Reagan is wrong. Has anyone ever heard of Charles Krauthammer? Ever read any of his stuff? He just died recently. Krauthammer at the time was a column and had been until he died last year, was a columnist at the Post. Before that, he had been one of Jackson's, Henry Jackson, a Democrat. He'd been a Democrat, was a speechwriter. Krauthammer, George Will, you heard of him? He's still alive. Very critical of INF and START. Interestingly enough, the conservatives. Krauthammer later claimed that he was wrong and that Reagan was right. So there was public opposition among conservatives and Republicans, moderates, whatever you want to call it, 
to this. But the Senate, by now, controlled by the Democrats, ratifies the treaty. And what happened is going to happen to the treaty? This week? Last week? Yeah, it looks like we might be withdrawing from it. Okay, 31 years later. Okay, so Reagan, by December of 87, this is the Washington Conf- Conference, the Washington Summit, has reclaimed a lot of that credibility, popularity that he lost from Iran-Contra. So the hearings occurred in the summer of 87, but here we are now about six months later, major arms control initiative, but in this case, reduction. Remember, despite our initial, everyone thinking of Richard Nixon and Watergate, remember how popular the SALT Treaty was in 1972. The Moscow Summit, the China Summit, were very popular among the American people, and he ultimately gets reelected overwhelmingly. So Reagan is reclaiming that status. Five months, five, six months later, in May of 88, he goes to Moscow for the Moscow Summit. And this is where he does a couple of, a couple of really famous things. This is, and it's in the book. The first thing is that he's walking through Red Square with Gorbachev. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? What he said, what did he say? Yeah. Is that where he said um, that the buildup of arms wasn't the cause of the distrust, but the distrust was the cause That's of the arms? That's at Reykjavik. Buildup? That's at exactly. Reykjavik. Yeah. But, which is important to keep in mind. Did he say that like, the Soviet Union like, wasn't an evil empire? Right. A journalist is walking along with him in Red Square and asks him, is this the evil empire you condemned so heartily five years ago? And he goes, that was a different time in a different place. And then, I'm not sure if it was that day or the day after, he goes to Moscow State University. This is Gorbachev's alma mater. And this is where he makes his, what I consider one of the most, maybe even more important long term than the tear down this wall speech. This is where he heartily endorses this and this. What is this? Glasnost. Well, kind of yeah, this is openness in Russian, right? Kind of? Openness, yeah. yeah. It's kind of. It translates most into openness in English. Kind of. This is where he is talking about small, low-level, incremental liberalization. This occurs after perestroika and around the time 87, 88. Perestroika starts in 85, 86. That's continuing, but this is where he's saying, you know what else we can do? We can open up things. Remember, Khrushchev had opened up some things. What is he calling for here that Reagan loves? Cole. Uh, like commercial interaction between the United States and the Soviet Union. Yeah, this is, can be Glasnost and Perestroika when it comes to economics, international trade. This will, by the way, be a theme of Gorbachev's at Malta. The U.S. has markets for their goods, whatever, whether they're good or bad. They have markets that our businessmen and women can cultivate and exploit. Okay? What else does it mean? That's a big one. Elizabeth? Um, the openness where like, they stopped um, disallowing political dissent. Right. You can actually now have open criticism of the Communist Party. And of, the, of, of him. We take that for granted, right? Right? I mean, this week we've seen it. <laughs> whoever the president is. Whoever the secretary of state is. If they say something, nobody gets thrown in jail 
if you're on a TV show and you call President Obama, you know, uh, a liar, or you call President uh, Trump an anti-Semite, it may be bad form in both instances, but you're not tossed in jail. Now he is saying that kind of criticism is allowed. So the underground publishing presses, the stuff, the places that published Solzhenitsyn's work, that published um, uh, Dr. Zhivago and other novels that were cr- even mildly critical of the Soviet Union, let alone Solzhenitsyn and the other dissidents, is now allowed. Okay? What else does it mean? That's the second big thing. There's a third thing he's pushing. James. Something analogous to a parliament? Yeah, there's political pluralism. Pluralism. In other words, if you want to create another party, let's just say, oh, you want to have a Democratic and Republican party in the Soviet Union, you won't get sent to Siberia. Okay? It's slow. It's painful. Because... Who else is watching besides us? We love it. Reagan endorses Glasnost and praises not only the entire idea of free markets, but depending on your interpretation, there are some people who say this is Reagan's call for globalization. There's a lot of talk in this speech about the importance of freedom of expression by using new technologies like the microchip. I can't remember who I said this to, but Schultz was the first Secretary of State to ever have a personal computer. I know that sounds ridiculous hearing it now. I didn't have one. Schultz was also a big believer in technology. He loves, he's still alive, he loves the internet. These kind of technological breakthroughs, they believe, can break down communism and other forms of dictatorship through freedom of expression. Okay? So if, and especially if you want free trade. But who else is listening? Eastern European. Yeah, guess what? Oh, okay. I'm a Hungarian. I'm a Pole. Hmm. Openness, freedom of expression. Well, can't we do it too? And Gorbachev begins to say yes. So by 87 and 88, this is spreading to, those are the two big countries that begin it, Poland and Czechoslovakia. You see the rebirth and the reemergence of solidarity. A great book I just read that I thought about using for this course that I may use next year. Uh, talks a lot about this and about how Reagan was trying with some success but not a lot of success to try to get the polls to liberalize even before this. By the time Gorbachev comes in, Gorbachev is willing to let the Poles and the Hungarians and then the others experiment. There's another group that is watching this, not the Eastern Europeans, that can be a problem for Gorbachev. Who are those people? Not the Eastern Europeans. The Georgian? Well, anyone non-Russian. Say the Georgians, the Ukrainians, the Baltics, the Lithuanians, the Estonians, the Latvians, let alone all of those Muslim majority southern republics. The, the gamble that he is making here is that the Soviet Union can be reformed and that communism can be strengthened. The problem is, once someone gets a taste of this kind of freedom, what do they usually want? More of the same. More of the same. And then independence. So while American and Soviet relations are improving by late 88 and early 89 when Bush comes in, what's happening is that the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe are starting to, the reins are being loosened, okay? 
One thing I wanted to mention here, can I, I don't know if you're going to all see it, but the governor, Governor's Island meeting, December 88. Right before that, Gorbachev had come to the UN and addressed the United Nations, the General Assembly. Very, one of the, arguably the most important speech, I would argue, that Gorbachev ever made, other than the, we're giving up <laughs> in 1991 and it's over. Does anyone know what he said at that speech? An important concession. Maybe the only thing more important is when he gave up SDI. He said that we, the Soviet Union, unilaterally, remember, the INF Treaty is a mutual withdrawal. The American Pershing missiles from Western Europe gone, the SS-20s from Eastern Europe gone. We, the Soviet Union now, December 88, will unilaterally withdraw a half a million troops from the Warsaw Pact countries. Without any, and by the way, the United States, you need to take all your troops out of Germany or wherever else they were in Europe. What does that mean? Or signify? Whatever. If I put that on the final, Vikram. It signifies that the former Warsaw Pact countries have the power to um, self-determine. Or they will soon likely have more power to determine their own fate. Absolutely. What else? What else does it signify? That's one thing. If I'm the Hungarians and the Poles, I'm like, finally. Cool. The loosing of these secret police sort of hard hands. Yeah. Keep in mind that one reason why it was hard for the Hungarians and the Czechs to really challenge Soviet supremacy is they have had troops there. In these, they're like the backbone or the backup to their own secret police. Well, if you lose half a million Soviet troops, it's going to make it a lot harder for their secret police organizations to, to knock around their people. Absolutely. What else? Uh, any interactions going forward from the U.S. or Western Europe with Eastern European countries will not, will not be as controlled as much by yeah. the Soviet Union and they're interacting with the countries Yeah, there's going to be a new political, the small p, relationship going forward between the West and the East. Absolutely. The last thing I would say is that it fits in with perestroika because just think of how much money it costs to house, feed, clothe, etc., a half a million troops. It was, in a big, it was a big stumbling block to Eisenhower and Truman before him, but Eisenhower in the 50s when he had to decide whether we should send 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand troops to Germany because it costs a ton of money. If you want to cut defense spending and in reform communism, one way you do it is to cut the amount of money you're spending on the troops overseas. Remember Nixon wanted to bring back some of our guys because he felt we were spending too much. Let them take care of their own defense. If you're Reagan, you're like, huh, what? Uh, this is awesome. This is amazing. Okay? But Bush is at Governor's Island. He's just been elected. And this is the end of today's class. We'll pick up the rest of this. We'll finish it up on Monday. Because what's going to happen is that Bush pulls back. You, you're the one who mentioned his reservations? Yeah. Yes. What do you mean by that? You're absolutely right. Bush has reservations. Um, he talks about in, this, in your book that after Bush gets elected and inaugurated, there's sort of this pause period where he has to reassess U.S. posture toward the Soviet Union and arms reduction. Yeah, he is concerned. Remember, Bush is, well, I think Bush's instincts are to take things really slow, to not overreact, which I think is not a bad thing, to not get ahead of yourselves. And his concern is that, remember, go back to that comment about a Gucci comrade. Let's not forget who these people are. Bush never believes until later. 
It, it takes a while. It takes about a year for Bush to actually believe that Gorbachev is a serious reformer of communism. He doesn't say, hey, this guy is going to change, everything's going to be miraculous, and the Soviet Union will be, will be close friends, everything, the threat is gone, the world will be a really safe place. He is, an, I think, an instinctual, instinctive mad guy. He is a, a Nixon guy, a Scowcroft, Ford, Kissinger, detente type of guy. His initial instincts are, let's reassess. What are the good things here? What are the bad things? Can we change those bad things? And so he institutes what has now become the pause, where they literally, for argument's sake, stop this Reagan-Gorbachev era of good feelings. Okay? So when he takes office in January, he basically orders a review of everything and says, let's stop and think about all of this before we move forward. Interestingly enough, it only lasts about four months. And I think some historians, some people, I think Gorbachev, a lot of them overreacted. Gorbachev was worried. He thought, oh, everything I've accomplished is gone. As it turned out, it's only going to last till May. So on Monday, we will pick up on this. We're going to talk about Bush's commencement addresses that he makes and the speeches he makes that announce his new policy, which actually is Reagan's policy. All right, I'll see you guys then. Thank you all for coming again.